Hi, and welcome to our last lesson in the series of the eight standards for mathematical practice. Up to this point, we've been through math practices one through seven, and today we're going to finish with math practice eight. You'll remember from our previous lessons that the math practices are a series of standards or practices that good mathematicians follow that help them to be good mathematicians. And since our goal this year is for us all to become better mathematicians, all of these are standards and practices that we ourselves want to adopt and emulate so that we can become better mathematicians. Starting with math practice one, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Now there are two pieces to this math practice. The first is make sense of problems. To make sense of problems means we're going to understand the problem no matter what it takes. We'll try a variety of problem solving techniques and strategies. I like acting it out or visualizing it. Others might like underlining important words. Whatever it takes, we want to make sure that we understand the problem because the next part of this math practice is to persevere in solving those problems. That means even when it's hard, we're going to keep on going. We're not going to stop because it's hard. We're only going to stop when we're finally done, even if it takes a long time and even if it's hard. Math practice two, is reason abstractly and quantitatively. You'll remember from our last video lessons that to reason abstractly is to use equations and symbols in order to help us solve quantitative or real life problems. Whenever we solve a problem and we get an answer like x equals 7, we need to make sure that we understand what that means in the real world. We can understand that to mean $7 per hour. So that's how we relate abstract and quantitative. Math practice three is to construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. Again, this is a two-parter. Constructing viable arguments means that we're showing our work or we're explaining or justifying all of the things that we know and say because that's what good mathematicians do. It helps us prove to one another that we know we're doing the right thing. The second part is to critique the reasoning of others. We also need to make sure that we have the skill of looking at others' work or listening to what others say, evaluating their reasons and their proofs, and we can do one of two things. We can either learn from them because we were wrong and they're teaching us something, or sometimes we can learn even more because we see that they're wrong and we have that opportunity to teach them. Math practice four is model with mathematics. This means that we're going to use a variety of tools to help us get through the problems, starting by representing the problems in different ways, such as graphs, tables, equations, pictures, and using math manipulatives. Math practice five, use appropriate tools strategically. There are a variety of tools that are available to us. We need to make sure that we're choosing the right ones for the right job. If I have a simple calculation, like two times six, it's better to use our brain, that's one math tool, than it is to type it into the calculator. So it's knowing when to use each type of tool. Math practice six, attend to precision. This is one of my favorites because it does deal with accuracy. It does deal with wanting to make sure that we're doing things right. But it's so much more than that too. Attending to precision is making sure that we have a good solid understanding of all of the definitions and terms and symbols so that we can use them with accuracy, precision, and clarity. And math practice seven, look for and make use of structure. It's really helpful to see how mathematics is built. It's really important to see that structure so that we can see how everything works together. Once we understand the, constru the structure, we can deconstruct and we can start taking things apart and use things that we have already known about mathematics to help us with our future things that we're trying to learn. That's it for the first seven. Now let's move on to math practice eight. Remember the format of our notes. We're going to start by writing down the math practice number and what it is. Um, this time we're actually going to do an activity or an example to help us understand before we write down what it means in our own words. And then finally we'll finish up with a reflectin, reflection. Here's math practice eight. Look for and express regularity in repeated reasoning. Remember, if at any point you need extra time to write this down, then pause the video to give yourself extra time because I do want all of this to be in your notes. Starting with our first example. Suppose I have made 25 pounds of fudge for Christmas and I have 11 friends, so I need to split that fudge into 11 containers. We understand that this problem is going to be 25 divided by 11. But this time, I'm not going to let you use your calculator. We're going to go old school, old fashioned division, long division with pencil and paper. Let's get started. When I'm doing this long division, I'm wanting to ask the question, how many times can 11 go into 25? 11 can go into 25 twice. 
That gets me to 22, which means that I'm still three away. So I'm not quite done. Uh, we're middle schoolers now, so we don't get to just stop and say remainder three. That means we've got to keep on going. So let's not forget where our decimal place is. And remember that we have access to unlimited zeros beyond that decimal point. And so we're going to annex a zero and bring it on down. And 11, can it go into 30? It can. It can go in two more times. 2 times 11 is 22. So I was trying to get all the way up to 30. I didn't make it that far. I made it up to 22. So there's 8 left over. And again, we're not done. So let's bring down another 0. And now we ask the question, can 11 go into 88? Hopefully you're quick like this. You know your 11 multiplication very easily. You know that that goes in 7 times. 11 sevens is 77. So I'm still not done. I'm still 3 away. So we got to bring down another 0. Can 11 go into 30? It can. It can go in two times. And we can see we only made it up to 22, so I'm 8 away. We're still not done. Got to bring in that extra 0 again. And asking the question, can 11 go into 80? 11 can go into 80 seven times. Get to 77. I hope at this point, maybe even earlier, you realize that we're starting to see some of the same things that we've already seen before, right? That's because what we have here is a repeating decimal. And I'm hoping that you recognize that before I even had to point it out. What we really have is 25 elevenths or 25 divided by 11 is 2 and 2 7 repeating. When we're doing this long division, and once we realized that it was a repeating decimal, we didn't need to continue to do that division anymore because we already saw that pattern that was repeating. And that's what Math Practice 8 is all about. It says look for and express regularity in repeated reasoning. We had this repetition, so we recognized what was going to continue happening, and we're not going to keep wasting any more of our time. Math Practice 1 says we're going to persevere until it's done, but sometimes Math Practice 8 comes in and saves the day. We see that pattern and we can go ahead and stop. So it's important to make notes here that we were able to stop because we saw that repetition. I'm including this in the notes as well. We saw the repetition. So we assumed it was going to continue. And we stopped dividing. Guess what? That's math practice eight. Good notes to include right here so that when we see that example, we remember how it's related to Math Practice 8. Here's your next example. I've got multiple figures, and I'm asking the question, how many interior central triangles are there in each of these figures? Let's break down those words. Interior means it's on the inside central triangles, so I'm looking for triangles, and the central, they all share that vertex right there in the center of each of the figures. So let's go ahead and count these. This triangle has one, two, three, so there are three interior central triangles. Here, in this four-sided figure, a square, we have one, two, three, four, so four. And I'm sure you're probably thinking at this point, do I need to include this in my notes? You know the answer is yes. Make sure you have this written down. Pause the video if you need that extra time. In this five-sided figure, this pentagon, we can see one, two, three, four, five interior central triangles, and one, two, three, four, five, six. In this six-sided hexagon, there are six interior central triangles. So the question is, typo here, let's fix that. How many would there be in a 20-sided figure? How many central interior triangles would be in a 20-sided figure? Do you really want to draw a 20-sided figure? I already know the answer is no. So instead of having to draw it to count it, why don't we use the patterns that we already saw and make a prediction? What's your prediction? I'm hoping your prediction was 20. We can come up with that number because in a three-sided figure, we see three separate central interior triangles, one triangle for each side of the figure. 
we moved on to the four-sided figure and we see four sides and each one of those sides creates another side in the central interior triangle. Continuing on that pattern, a five-sided figure has five and a six-sided figure has six and it makes sense that a 20-sided figure will have 20 interior central triangles. If you really want to, you are welcome to draw it, but that wouldn't be following math practice eight. Math practice eight is recognizing that pattern and assuming that that pattern is gonna continue and making some really good predictions based on those patterns. Let's move on to our third and final example. Suppose we have a garden that is three feet by five feet. Uh, I want you to first start by sketching a picture and I want us to be able to calculate the perimeter because if I have a garden I want to be able to build a fence around it to protect it so I need to know how much fencing I'm going to need. So draw your picture first, three feet by five feet and then we'll calculate the perimeter. Three feet by five feet which means this side is also going to be five feet and this side is also going to be three feet. Hopefully you remember that to find the perimeter we add up all of the sides. So we have five plus five that's ten plus three plus three that's going to be sixteen feet. So for this garden I would need sixteen feet. Now let's continue on with this example. What if I doubled the length and the width of the garden? So I'm doubling the length and I'm doubling the width. So now the garden is three feet doubled is six feet, five feet doubled is 10 feet. So my garden is now a six by 10 foot. Let's draw another picture. Here's the six feet, here's the 10 feet, six feet again, and 10 feet again. What's the new perimeter? 10 plus 10 is 20 plus six plus six is 32 feet. So answer the question, how did that perimeter change? Originally it was 16 feet, here it's 32 feet. How did it change? Hopefully you're not surprised to see that when I doubled the side lengths, the perimeter also doubled. Now we're not quite done yet, let's do one more. Again we're going back to this original garden, the three feet by five feet, and what happens if I take that three feet and five feet and now I triple it? So three feet tripled is going to be nine feet and five feet tripled is now going to be 15 feet. So when I draw this new garden so that I can get a visual and start calculating the perimeter, I have nine feet and 15 feet, nine feet and 15 feet. Okay, so we have tripled the lengths, what do you think is going to be happening to the perimeter? 15 and 15 is 30, 9 and 9 is 18, and 30 plus 18 gets me 48 feet. Again, we're comparing it to that original. Remember that our original garden had a perimeter of 16 feet, but now that I've tripled it, I've tripled the lengths, what happens to the perimeter? Well, the perimeter also tripled. So now it's time to apply math practice 8. What if now I quadruple the length and the width? What do you think is going to happen to the perimeter? Take a second and think about that, make your estimate, remembering that when I doubled the length and width, the perimeter was doubled. When I tripled the length and the width, the perimeter was tripled. I'm hoping you're seeing a pattern and you're making the prediction that if we quadruple the length and the width, then the per perimeter is also going to be quadrupled. And that prediction would be absolutely correct. And we wouldn't need to actually do any calculations because we're using math practice eight. We found that pattern that continued to repeat and we can start assuming that it's going to continue even on different problems. Now we are ready to put math practice eight in our own words. Remember math practice eight is look for and express regularity in repeated reasoning. Take a look at those examples again and what is it that you're noticing? How can you use math practice eight? What does it really mean? I'll give you some ideas, some things that I think are helpful to include when you put it in your own words. In each one of these examples there was some sort of repetition, there was some sort of pattern. Once I recognized that pattern I was able to use it and make predictions about future problems. That has something to do with math practice eight, so keep that in mind as you're putting it in your own words. 
Once you've done that and you have written it down in your own notes, you need to make sure that you remember that this is a Canvas homework assignment. So after you're done watching the video, go ahead and plug this into Canvas so that you can get credit for that. Now let's finish up with our reflection. Remember, I'm going to help you out with reflection so that you can help set yourself a goal. I can look for an express regularity and repeated reasoning by looking for patterns. But that's just a piece of it. Once you look at those patterns, once you see those patterns, understand the significance of them and do something with it. Make some predictions. Another great way that you can apply Math Practice 8 is to use strategies that you know work for other problems. That is it. We have officially finished all eight of our math practices. I hope it feels as good to you as it does to me. Now we know how good mathematicians do math, and now we can become better mathematicians by following these same eight standards for mathematical practice. That's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.